This is Philip Rostek speaking. Uh, this is part seven of a piece that we're calling My Life. Uh, I'll speak in broad generalities now. Um, up till now, we've talked about pretty much a very positive and wonderful experience during my days of early childhood and uh, education. Um, but there's another side to it. I won't dwell on it, but my first year at Carnegie Mellon, um, I worked really hard. I had pretty much a almost bronchial pneumonia, if it wasn't that. I was on antibiotics. I weighed 110 pounds. I had black circles under my eyes. And uh, afterwards, I went to um, to New York City and... and um, looking for a job in advertising instead of art. Uh, I didn't know what a recession was. In 1973, there was a big recession in the country, and um, and things weren't moving very well. I didn't know that. I kind of thought it was my fault uh, that I couldn't find a job. Um, and um, so I got thrown out of a lot of tall buildings in New York City back then. So it, it started to sink in that... Um, uh, a master's degree in, in artwork was um, only worth um, uh, what it was worth. And um, I had no regrets about what I had done. But then um, I'm wondering what it really did prepare me to do in the, in the outside world. I abruptly came to the conclusion that my skill set was not that big of a deal when it came to capitalism in America. And so I didn't really think at 23 years old, I was only 23, that I had much to contribute to being a, a college professor or whatnot. I didn't know how to make money. And so I took a job at Joseph Horn's company making $2.49 an hour, putting twinkle lights on Christmas trees because we were in the Christmas season. That's how I got my job. I worked with Larry Vollmer. Larry Vollmer was at Joseph Horn's when Andy Warhol got his first job at Horn's, and he also worked for Larry Vollmer. So there was a very curious set of circumstances where my life ran parallel to Warhol in the most unexpected kind of way. I learned a lot at Joseph Horn's, not only from Larry Vollmer, who was terrific at his job, um, but about Andy, because everybody recalled stories about Andy working there and, um, and uh, what that entailed uh, and how so many people thought that he was a little strange but how Larry Vollmer uh, always thought that Andy was talented, and instead of having Andy do the usual grunt work, he had Andy leafing through magazines looking for ideas for windows, uh, window presentations, stuff like that. Um, I should mention that Joseph Horns was a department store, and Larry Vollmer was a well-known display director that came in from Bonwit Teller in New York City. That impressed Andy and me too because Larry was great at his job. I learned a lot from him. He was nice to me. Uh, anyway, my first task at Horns was to get a desk for Liberace. I asked Larry, what kind of desk? He said, get something bitchy, Frenchy. Anyway, Liberace was very kind and it worked out. Later, I would move to Kaufman's where I made more money, but I had to know merchandise there and I knew nothing about merchandise. Very stressful. And um, I met a great guy there, Tony Calabrese, who kind of took me under his wing, shared his toolbox with me. And sooner or later, um, I was able to hang in there. And uh, when a job opened up in Greensburg where I was from, and a suburban store was being built there. I got that job. It was even worse when I had more responsibilities. Uh, but again, I kind of hung in there 
and then sooner or later they brought me downtown to work in the men's area where I was more comfortable. Um, they had brought in Tony Turcasio from the outside, who was enormously talented. He was the director of of uh, uh, fashion at Saks Fifth Avenue when they brought him back into Pittsburgh to clean up the men's department. And so um, Tony wasn't sure if I could actually accomplish the kind of things that he wanted to do, but the buyers kind of backed me up. And, um, and so I dug in and they helped me find out what Tony wanted to do. And finally, I learned the retail business and in a certain kind of way, uh, for a time, I got good at it. I was good at doing windows and creative things, and Tony supported that. Also, I was good at rigging bus forms, uh, but I never gave up my, my real artwork. I moved back into individual expression, and um, the book that Marcia had gotten me, The Fioretti, became an important event in my life where uh, the idea of um, St. Francis' idea being uh, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, who said he was cloistered in the world. I saw a parallel between that and what was going on in the, in the digital world um, that included now the internet. I was able to produce um, some work about St. Francis that got the attention in some local show, shows here. Um, Murray Horn was a curator here in Pittsburgh that always um, beautifully supported my work. And I think that's why I came to the attention of um, uh, St. Bonaventure University through um, a guy um, who was a manager in the Erie store, um, the Erie retail store of Kaufman's. He turned, he turned St. Bonaventure on to me and my work doing pictures about St. Francis, which led to me having a kind of uh, major exhibition at the, at the newly built, um, it was called the Quick Center for the Arts. It was an $8 million building and I did the inaugural show. Um, they took my work into their permanent collection which led to me getting a job uh, later on um, with uh, Seton Hill University. And um, uh, that had a lot to do with a friend, uh, Bob Dodds, who supported my work um, when uh, I had graduated from CMU and had written articles in a free newspaper called The Art Doctor. Uh, Bob Dodds liked the art doctor, and Bob was uh, an important person in, in my creative life. I would also meet up with my friend Shalom Newman, who settled in New York City, and we did collaborative work in a place called the Sculpture Garden, uh, which was south uh, of Houston during um, what was called the East Village Phenomenon. <laughs> in the Lower East Side of New York City. I was able to fly in there on People Express Airline for 50 bucks from Pittsburgh and still hold, my, hold down my job at Kaufman's. Um, I, I did a lot of video documenting um, that um, environment uh, and the urban things that were happening there. I was also invited to come back into Carnegie Mellon by Bruce Breland to be a member of his newly formed DAX group, the Digital Art Exchange. And that was a big addition to my life where I almost got what the equivalent of what would be a PhD degree working with his graduate students there in the new world of uh, digitization that was unfolding inside the internet. Somewhere between that experience and my experience in New York City um, in the Wild West days of the East Village and the early days of the Internet, I found that the rules were playground rules in both cases. Um, loose relationships were like that. And um, email was hot. And the environment in the collaborative 
environment in New York City and the street scene was also hot. By hot, it, I, I mean ambiguous. There was a lot of hurt feelings, um, a lot of people trying to adjust to the paradigm change that was occurring when the internet was introduced into the world. Soon, I would be downsized at Kaufman's, uh, would have a heart attack and uh, quadruple bypass surgery and would continue my work as a painter uh, in the basement. And I had the good fortune of being hired by Seton Hill University to be a faculty member that taught painting and drawing. This got me back up on my feet and I'm eternally grateful uh, to that university, especially to Joanne Boyle, the president who brought me into the school. Several years ago, uh, I was honored as being one of the founding members of the Seton Hill Art Department. I brought a lot of new students in and what I learned from Lepper and Breland uh, at Carnegie Mellon, I, uh, I brought into um, Seton Hill University. It was just as important at Seton Hill as it was at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. I had a very positive uh, relationship with Maureen Vassot at uh, Seton Hill University. She was um, the art history teacher there and very uh, popular with the students and had a great command over the material that she taught. Um, there were kind of obsolete slide drawers that uh, she made available to me. Uh, and they became um, an instrument uh, for me because I could use them to advance the ideas of Hoyt Sherman in my drawing classes uh, that stressed eidetic memory um, as, a, um, as a factor in uh, increasing students' ability to draw pictures. Um, and... Um, and that was possible because uh, Bruce Breland knew Hoyt Sherman and turned me on to um, to turn me on to that information. It was uh, uh, not well known, and it was terribly sophisticated, and um, and it really it really does work. And so I was successful in in um, my role as a teacher. I was promised about. Um, Nine years after my quadruple bypass around the year, let's say 2000, and um, I think it was 1999, and then when my heart gave out, um, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to get a heart transplant in 2008 at Presbyterian Hospital um, in Pittsburgh. My doctors were fantastic. And so uh, artistically, uh, it had an effect on me. There's a lot of speculation about heart transplantation. I became pretty musical, and my coordinators, um, they, they told me that playing the piano was good therapy, and so I worked at that quite a bit. I thought that I could actually hear musical notation a little bit clearer than I had ever had the ability to do in the past. And... Um, so music became a kind of bigger factor in my life. And I think that's a good place for us to pause at this point.